Okay, back again, taking another look at the uh, trigger brake in the Inglis L9A1. At this point, we've had uh, several shooting sessions, and um, in the last shooting session, you saw uh, Plamena, Logan, and me um, doing some shooting, and everything with this uh, with his handgun since we uh, installed an alternative sear spring for the trigger brake benefit, and uh, since we installed all BH spring solution springs, and um, expanded the extractor channel and uh, tuned the extractor or fitted the extractor for uh, optimal hold and we have had just absolutely outstanding function uh, from this point and we want to go back and take one more quick look at the uh, at the trigger brake because that was uh, a little bit of a concern when we first uh, when we first got this pistol out of the box so we're going to see where we're at Okay, five pounds, seven ounces. So that's really in the range of where where uh, it's a good. How do I say this? In the high power pistol, because of the high power trigger action, um, I am I am a person who you know I have a real affinity for five and a half to five and three quarters on a on a high power trigger. Reason is because. Um, I'm always realistic that, you know, seldom in, in real life is a defensive situation going to require one shot. And um, so that being the case, I, I do want to have resistance on the trigger that's going to, uh, that's going to create a trigger break weight that's not going to, to uh, uh, it's, it's not going to, to uh, be impacted hopefully by my adrenaline or, or whatever's going on. Uh, with me at the time that uh, I would need to be firing multiple shots. So um, the sear spring, I wanted to introduce you real quickly to that. It's an easy, this is the BH Advanced sear spring. We got the same result out of a Browning factory uh, sear spring as well, which can be used in this uh, uh, just the same. This is the BH Advanced, actually type two sear spring, we call it. It has the bend here. And it is that bend that makes this approximately equivalent to a Browning uh, factory sear spring. The difference in these springs, the biggie difference, is you just saw me install it without tearing apart all of the uh, fire control group in the back of the frame in order to get the sear spring in. That's typical what you would need to do in installing a Browning factory uh, sear spring. So um, the reason why we went to that is uh, when we need to, we can pop that in, pop that out. And if we wanted to, there's also an optimized version of this same spring without that bend in the middle that you saw. Uh, but this one is the type two. It's the, it's the more pressure on the sear choice. And just for a matter of, um, just for a matter of conversation here, um, when you are trying to reduce a trigger break on a high power pistol, doing that by removing pressure or lightening the pressure on the sear. The sear is what keeps the hammer from going forward and keeps the gun from firing until it's time. Um, taking pressure off of the sear is probably the last place that you want to really go and do that. The places where you might get um, a better trigger break might be a lighter trigger return spring, might be uh, polishing of the trigger subassembly components, um, might be polishing the sear lever that's here to take resistance off of the sear lever when the trigger is uh, pressing against that, um, and possibly going to a lighter version of the mainspring. That will take hammer pressure off the sear. It doesn't take stability off of the sear uh, in, that, in that event. So, okay, we are going to go to some other BH components in this uh, uh, Inglis L9A1 to confirm compatibilities. All right, moving right along with the Inglis L9A1, and we have uh, three more components installed in this one. First of all, the BH Advanced Trigger Subassembly. This is our gold-plated version. The BH Safety Fast Shooting System, or Fast Safety as it's sometimes called. And for those not familiar with that uh, Fast Safety, the uh, there's about 20 four benefits, I believe, 22 or 24 benefits of the safety fast shooting system in high powers. But the, the main event is being able to carry condition one in the state that you see right now. When you pull the safety off, hammer cocks, and you're ready to fire. When you go back on safe, you push the hammer forward and the safeties cam up. That also comes with an extended slide stop. We've also put on the convertible ambi mag catch and show you how that works there. 
and when you in the right hand you never know that that uh, you never know that that uh, ambi is there um, <clears throat> the and on the inside we want to take a quick look we also installed BH's buffering recoil spring guide rod and that is this guide rod right here and what it is, is it's a shock absorber. In other words, when the slide gets near to the back of recoil, where the slide and frame kind of collide together, this picks up extra resistance on the slide and buffers that back end recoil. It can be uh, a real nice uh, uh, benefit uh, for helping to control muzzle flip. Uh, and so we've installed that. Um, the BH trigger subassembly, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, this is an entirely redesigned subassembly for the, for the all high power pistols. We did want to make sure we confirmed compatibility in this uh, Inglis L9A1, and we have. Uh, some of the benefits of the BH Advanced Trigger is it's a very straight back trigger pull. If you grab your high power, Inglis or otherwise, and you have a standard trigger, do what I just did and watch the motion of your finger. You'll see it making a down and back motion, whereas the BH Advanced Trigger subassembly is set up so that it dictates that the fingers will be making a more pure straight back kind of a motion. You also get the benefit of magazine eject assist you just saw it that's an extra spring that's used only with the bh advanced trigger sub assembly um, and the great benefit that we picked up here on the trigger part i want to show you right now um, is the reset the reset has been improved um, just it's really really nice um, and we're gonna we're gonna kind of try to show you that right now I will give you an idea of the reset. Just that short of a reset, which is typically very desirable. We got about that much on the take up and the brake and the reset. And that reset is really authoritative. In other words, you have really nice push uh, on the finger coming uh, back forward when it's time to uh, reset the trigger, but the take up is very light. It's um, it's uh, very smooth and no artificial resistance of any kind going on in there. And so we have confirmed basically all BH uh, upgrades and optimizations. We have the uh, RDIH BH tactical ergonomic shooting grips. We'll be probably uh, putting on a pair of uh, Walnut Masters grips uh, on this as well here someday. Um, so yeah, there we go. That's the uh, that's the next chapter. Hey guys, Mark Allen, BH Spring Solutions LLC, BHSpringSolutions.com, back again for another session of High Power University. This is both a High Power University standalone session and also intended for inclusion in BH Spring Solutions evaluation and analysis of the Inglis L9A1 high power clone. We have that right here, highly modified now. This one contains all of BH Spring Solutions upgrades in it, but this is not the actual subject of the day. So we're going to go ahead and bring in the subject of the day. And the subject of the day is right there. That is a magazine that is is being shipped with and coming with the Inglis L9A1. We don't know if these magazines that I'm going to show you right now are showing up anywhere else um, in any of the other high power clones uh, from Turkey or not. But, um, you know, we're just going to show you our observations and uh, we'll go from there. We picked up on this that there was a difference in the magazines that are being shipped with the Inglis. What we picked up on was this, is you're going to notice right there. If you see this gap between the slide stop and the top of this lockup notch in the slide, that gap should not be there. That gap is, um, is caused by the slide stop is not fully engaging uh, or not being fully engaged by the magazine follower. And because it's not, it's not camming all the way up and it's not, uh, it's not going into full lockup uh, of the slide. Now I just put in a Metgar magazine and now you see no gap. Does the same thing with the original slide stop. It's no different um, in, in what you see from this, uh, from this perspective. This is full lockup of the slide stop in the lockup notch in the slide. And again, we just have the same looking 15 round magazine that came with the Inglis 
and we get that. Now, the implication of that is this, is watch my thumbnail here. Be able to manipulate the slide stuff. I wasn't even using my whole thumb. That would be impossible against the uh, pressure from the recoil spring uh, with the slide locked back if we had full lockup. Okay, so what is this about? Why are we not getting full lockup of the slide stop in the slide? Another implication of this um, is I was, uh, you know, uh, racking the slide and observing this with both of these magazines and with the, with the magazine that came with the Inglis, I had one event where the slide was locked back and the pistol was being hit. I was holding the pistol in my right hand and the slide just slammed home um, without me doing a thing. Uh, that means there was so little metal that was being held there that it just, it just didn't hold, uh, in the slide lock back position. So, um, <clears throat> these look like the same magazines. This one says made in Italy. This is the one that came with the English HP one five. Um, it's not really the same engraving as we see on the Metgar magazines. Um, and we don't have the same, uh, you know, Metgar inscription uh, here. But, you know, it, it looks like something maybe, I guess, partially made in at, at Metgar or something. Um, but we started looking for where are the differences in these. Look at the height of the mag follower first. The mag follower is right here. And if it looks like this one is riding lower than this one, and this one is riding higher, this is the one that's fully engaging the slide stop. And this is the one that came with the English that does not fully engage the slide stop. Um, it's not pushing high enough. In other words, the height of this follower matters. And it's not pushing high enough to get full engagement of any slide stop uh, in this pistol. Another thing that we noticed, uh, no difference in the height of the magazines whatsoever. You can see there, those are identical. However, on the back, we do see a difference as well. And the difference is here. Here's the Metgar, and here's the one that uh, came with the English. And we see this kind of uh, dug out here at the back of the magazine, and we're straight across on the Metgar. Um, I don't know that that makes a whole world of difference to anything. <coughs> the difference, the main difference, if any, is the English magazine does tend to expose about half of the primer, whereas you have good primer co coverage of the primer in the Metgar mag. And we also have determined that the, that the round is tending to ride a little higher in the Metgar mag as well when we gauge them. That's the Metgar gauge. And I'm going to show you, it, you'll, you'll actually be able to see this. We'll put this round into the English magazine, we'll call it. And we put our gauge tool in place, and you see lots more room, at least that's the way I'm seeing it, between the bottom of the gauge tool and the top of the cartridge casing. So and it's, it's, they're holding a little differently, but as far as how the, the, the magazine gauges, both of these are gauging fine. They're parallel with the gauge tool itself. I'm going to take these apart real quick. We're going to show you what they changed on the inside. This is the Metgar here on the left. And this is the English, I guess, on the right. We do have different shape of inner base plate. So that is a change. Um, we did see one thing. That I guess you would say would be a plus, um, and that is the English magazine, the follower is affirmatively attached or held to the to the magazine spring. On the uh, the Metgar, it's normal for it to not be, and it would be oriented like that, and then back into the magazine, and it is not in any way uh, affirmatively attached. Um, so as Let's see if I can show it this way. So these are the same, you know, magazine bodies themselves. But as you can see, we're going to take up more space in the magazine with this design. So where did they buy the space back or give the space back from? And it, it was given back out of the spring. Um, and what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to line that spring up. And you're going to notice there's about one less coil of spring in the magazine spring in the English magazine compared to the um, compared to the Metgar. But um, naturally you'd expect longer life out of more spring. 
um, and that's and that's typical. You uh, start cutting down a spring to do the same job, and probably you're going to have a shorter life. Um, they did get you know stability with follower that's more like a Metgar 13 round instead of a 15 round magazine. Uh, but the give back is in the spring, and and it's too bad the follower is not coming up high enough in the uh, magazine in order to uh, effectively uh, engage the slide stop fully uh, into the slide. So we wanted to uh, we wanted to show this um, really for proper and correct function in a high power, especially that full engagement of the slide stop. Um, the Inglis magazines that we have here uh, that came with the Inglis L9A1 that we have do not do it. And um, this is a strong, strong rationale for, I guess you'd say, the genuine Metgar magazine product um, that uh, that has been proven for a very long time. It appears the ones that are coming with the Inglis do have, uh, do have some trade-offs or some compromises. Um, and, and again, the biggie, uh, you know, the, the spring life here, uh, um, usually your feed lips in a uh, magazine, uh, in a high power magazine, give up the ghost before the magazine spring does, quite honestly. It's the reason we have a magazine gauge tool to gauge that angle. Um, and a reason why we recommend that for, for every high power owner and know that your magazines are in good shape and they're gauging correctly. Um, the biggie here is the followers not correctly functioning the slide stop into uh, all the way into the fully engaged position. Folks, thanks for watching. I'm Mark Allen, BH Spring Solutions LLC, bhspringsolutions.com for High Power University. Okay, we are back with Inglis L9A1. Next, uh, next thing I want to have. We, want, we wanted to take a close kind of a look at going to be able to explain some things about the Inglis and um, actually this will I believe also apply to the Gersan. Um, want to talk hammer struts and sears and the hammer struts these are this is kind of an easy one and I'm going to show you a couple of differences that uh, we see in the Inglis hammer. This is a Browning factory uh, high power hammer assembly. This is the Inglis and first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to line these up and I've lined up the hammer part, the business part of the hammer. I've lined up the half cock notch and now what I want to focus you in on is this is the hammer tooth that uh, blocks the hand, the, the sear blocks the hammer here at this point, kind of like that. And you're going to notice that the hammer tooth has been moved back. That allows that uh, Inglis hammer to come more forward when it um, when it is in the cocked position. What they've done here is they've attempted to make the the uh, hammer be in the cocked position, but a little bit more forward and not so far back. And this is to uh, they're they're attempting to. Um, um, effect a positive change on the fact that the high power has always had a tendency, most models, including the Brownings, have had a tendency to hammer bite the shooter's shooting hand. And so this is how they have attempted to go about it. Um, I'm not sure the hammer actually comes back any less in this, in this scenario, but it does get behind, it does get behind the sear and is in a you see when I line up these hammer tooths like that, you see the difference in the position here of the hammer itself, the hammer face, and it's going to also mean this area of the hammer as well. So um, we also noticed the hammer strut pin has been changed. I'm going to explain to you the uh, FN and Browning protocol for assembling their hammer struts. They had a hammer strut pin that looks like this, and you're going to notice there's like a lip or a ridge or a uh, yeah a lip on the one end and then the other end is just flat. Um, when we see this installed, however, what we notice is the hammer is made so that that lip gets flush. So they've uh, created a, a divot here in the hammer so that lip gets flush and it appears they've come back on this side and that's a press. 
that has pressed that hammer strut pin and that encourages it to expand and stay in position. Um, the hammer strut pin needs to stay in position because it's otherwise it's going to be having contact with its environment. Um, the Inglis hammer strut pin is a basic pin and there's not really any provision on the uh, uh, hammer or anything that's been done to it, you know, especially to keep it in the pistol. Now, I noticed this because I noticed that one side, after we uninstalled this hammer strut, one side of the pin was a little bit farther out. Um, when it's correctly positioned, it's actually recessed on both sides, but there's not really anything to keep it positively in place. It does have to be tapped in. But that's another change that we just we just happened to notice. Um, one of the things I want to talk about next, though, is the subject of the trigger brake weights we were getting with the Inglis out of the box because they are not typical for a new high power out of the box. Um, <clears throat> typical for Brownings um, was in the seven and a half to eight and a half generally pound range. Um, we see lots and lots of Gersans that um, come to us, and they're about a seven and a half pound trigger pull, just like the Brownings were. Um, this one came, you saw it in, uh, I think, our first session. Uh, average uh, brake weight was about three and three quarter pounds. So we've been, you know, looking out for, you know, okay, so how does that happen? Um, and of course, we found the sear spring with the uh, altered angle on it that really depressurizes the uh, sear spring's ability to apply pressure to the sear. Um, so we did affect a change. Now, when we went to a Browning factory sear spring, um, for all intents and purposes, that really should have put us back up above, say, a seven pound trigger pull in between that, say, seven and eight pound range that would be fairly typical in a traditional operating system but it didn't and so so you know we, it kind of begs the question for us why not and I want to show you the other contributor to that lighter trigger pull and what I've got here is I have two high power sears in my left hand is a Browning factory new high power sear in my right hand is the Inglis sear now, um, some noticeable differences that I found on these immediately is um, if we take this dimensional measurement, and I'm talking from here to here, basically the thickness or the dimension of the sear face, 1.03 is what this Browning one measures, and 0 0.94 is what the Inglis measures. So about 9% smaller surface area. Another thing that I noticed that I'm not sure we're going to be able to pick up on, but it sure appears under magnification that this disengagement area of the sear, which is really this edge right there, it appears that may have been uh, chamfered or angled just slightly right on the bottom edge, and we definitely don't have that on the Browning sear. Um, that's going to cause the sear and the hammer to disengage, I guess you'd say, more smoothly and uh, with less uh, influence, with less pressure uh, from the uh, sear lever on the sear. And so um, you also notice on the Browning factory sear, we can see, I'm not sure if it'll show up, but those are machining marks. Um, and so this appears to not have been tumbled at all after manufacture. The rest of the sear, I believe, has been deburred. Um, the uh, Inglis sear, um, it, it, I feel a lot more rounded edges. It's like it got uh, a lot more time in the tumbler. And definitely, I believe it, it was in the tumbler after the machining of the sear face. Uh, now, you're going to have less life of this particular sear than you're going to have of this one. There's less metal starting out. They have done this in order to get a more refined break of the hammer away from the sear when those clear each other. And so that's what, uh, that's what this, that's what this tells us. Um, I don't really have, at this point, we're not going to say good, bad, or indifferent. Obviously the Browning factory sear looks rather unrefined makes a lot of sense why we would have um, some different characteristics of this trigger in a browning with this sear. Um, however, after two or three hundred rounds, 
those machining marks are going to be gone. Uh, these things polish themselves with these hammer tooths because it's a lot of pressure pushing these together against each other and every time they clear it's a metal to metal clearance disengagement and so these these parts tend to polish each other uh, with use. It appears to me that they have possibly changed the dimension of the sear itself but have left it in a tumbler uh, maybe long enough to get a cleaner edge here starting out. So, you know, it's we're not judging it good, bad, or indifferent. It's just is what is. And with this particular sear uh, finishing effort that they have here, it does change some of the equations as far as um, affecting a trigger break in a particular break range because you're definitely going to have less resistance and an easier clearance of the sear and the hammer. Uh, with the uh, with the English sear. The, the downside is you're going to have a bit less uh, shorter service life because you're starting out with less metal uh, in the beginning. So there you go. Differences in the sear and hammer assemblies of the English L9A1 compared to the Browning factory parts. Okay, we're going to take a quick break here from what we've been doing with the Inglis L9A1, and we're going to talk about a couple of the things that we've learned and seen and observed so far, and a little bit more explanation um, about about why we kind of keyed in on some of the things that we uh, that we did. Um, at this point, you know, we diagnosed and figured out why we had this kind of unusually low um, trigger break on this on this handgun, and I want to talk with you just a little bit about why. That is such an important factor. And um, you saw earlier that I was scaling without the slide. Just I wanted to see how much pressure does it take to pull back the trigger. And we were around a pound and a half. Um, okay, fine. Um, in the slide, you have a sear lever that is contacted by the trigger's trigger pawl or trigger lever. And it has a spring behind it. And we figured that that adds a quarter to a half pound uh, of additional resistance. So just generically, uh, for approximating purposes, let's just say that the resistance from the trigger return spring and the resistance of the sear lever and the metal-to-metal -metal contact that you've got, you know, from the trigger subassembly to the sear lever accounts for about two pounds. And you remember when we were first doing trigger brake testing and we were seeing Oh, two pounds, 14 ounces, I think a time or two, it was under three, and then we had a lot in the three, and it came out to an average of about three and three quarter pounds. And so if you take three and three quarters minus two, you got a pound and three quarters, sometimes. Sometimes the difference between those was 14 ounces, sometimes it was a pound. The implication of this is a couple things. Um, what I have found in shooting shooting what I call rapid fire shooting drills. Now to, to, to explain what does that look like? It looks like deholstering. It looks like delivering five rounds in a five inch circle at five yards in under five seconds. And in my case, I want under four seconds. Um, when I have too light of a trigger, what happens to me is, is it becomes a very difficult thing for my reflexes to get timing on. And, and the what specifically causes it is this, is in order for me to get to the what we call the wall, you see nothing is happening with the hammer at this point. This is the take-up phase. That take-up phase we've calculated is taking about two pounds of pressure. If it's only taking another 14 ounces to cause that, um, my finger's not that good. And my, my, my trigger control, frankly, is not that good. No matter how much I've shot, um, you know, when there's a differentiation in just normal trigger travel and what causes the break and it's like 14 ounces or a pound or a pound and a half, that is not enough for me. What I find in rapid fire situations is um, I will have inevitably shots fire off before I have gotten the uh, muzzle rise or muzzle flip that's normal in a semi-auto handgun before I've gotten that reposition, before I've got my sights repositioned, I will know that, wow, that one just popped off just like a split second earlier than I wanted it to. And when you have a too light of a trigger break situation going on on the high powers trigger characteristics, I think that's what a lot of guys get into that's a very, very difficult thing to practice around. And so um, the other issue with this is, is this, is, you know, for a purely range target pistol, 
Um, the things I'm talking about don't have great consequence. However, we always look at this assuming that, that any firearm may be in a defensive role. If you have a firearm in a defensive role, and I want to just talk to you, you know, just kind of some real life stuff. Um, everything that we understand about, you know, if, if you had to use a handgun in a defensive situation to stop an attack, sometimes, no matter how, you know, justified we may know the shooting is, um, sometimes prosecutors have to have it proven to them. Sometimes civil litigation um, judges and juries have to have it proven to them. And there's no upsides if you have something that they can get away with calling a hair trigger. Um, so, so we're conscious of that. Um, I don't know what a hair trigger is, but I can tell you that it seems to be a term that is, is negatively cast. Um, you have seen us going for, a, say, a five to five and a half pound-ish uh, trigger break weight in this handgun. My belief and philosophy behind why that's a good trigger break range for a defensive handgun is because it really matches just about most of the law enforcement issued handguns coast to coast in the United States as well as military issued handguns. And against, you know, that reply, you know, if somebody tries to claim that my five and a half pound trigger is a quote hair trigger, whatever that is, um, you, you know, we would then have to have the discussion about, you know, why are we issuing hair triggers then across the country to all law enforcement and military? That argument probably <laughs> holds up as strong as anything. Um, I don't know how to make a strong argument that a three pound trigger pull is not a hair trigger. Now, between us, um, I'm going to tell you, if it's taking two pounds of my finger pressure in order to, in order to just affect the trigger getting to the point where now we're able to, to fire the weapon, and it's only taking another 14 ounces of my trigger finger pressure or another pound, um, this is, this is, now gets to be very iffy, <laughs> I would say, in terms of, you know, between you and me, I'm going to tell you right now, if it takes no more than 14 ounces of pressure to cause a seer to clear a hammer tooth, at least in my head, I'm running in a territory that I don't want to try to defend that. And I don't want to try to make a strong argument against it because I don't know one right offhand. Um, reason why we think about this, say, five to five and a half pound trigger break range, it does match a lot of um, taxpayer-sponsored expense into guns in law enforcement and in military um, in the United States. So we feel relatively okay about that. Some things I want to share with you that, that, that are kind of in the not okay range, and that is, you remember we put about two, 200, 300 rounds through this handgun with its original springs. The springs that really regulate slide velocity are your recoil spring, which is located right here, and your main spring, which is located right there. Both of these regulate slide velocity. Slide velocity is, is one indication of how fast your slide is reciprocating is how far you're throwing the empty shell casings. And in just a few hundred rounds, we went from uh, extracting about six foot to about 12 foot. It doubled in a matter of only a couple hundred rounds. This is not normal. That is not what we normally see. Um, on YouTube and at bhspringsolutions.com, you can find where we did a 6,000 round test in the TISOS BR9 that was back in 2018. We then took our springs, retested them for resistance and push. Uh, compared to their original resistance and push of the springs. Our recoil spring re retained 95% of its original uh, resistance and push. That's really what you're looking for when it comes to uh, especially high powers. Um, we don't know the reason why these springs were giving up their resistance as fast as they did because normally thousands of rounds does not affect that, uh, that sort of and kind of a change. Um, the big reason that we can get concerned about that, not only is accuracy and uh, recoil control, but also the faster that slide is moving, the harder this barrel cam lug is hitting that locking lug cam. And so when the slide, slide reciprocates, we, we end up in this position and literally the barrel slams into the locking lug cam. 
Okay, so the main concern we have with excessive slide velocity is <clears throat> barrel starts out in this position installed in the slide. Slide reciprocates rearward and slams that barrel, we call it tilting, but it's actually that barrel cam lug meeting the locking lug cam and it's causing it to go into this position. So that barrel cam lug is slamming into that locking lug cam and we want to keep that engagement under control. We want to keep it regulated. That takes springs that don't give up in a matter of a few hundred rounds. Um, also, we can uh, share with you the BH Advanced Barrel. It has a different construction. I'm going to show it to you here real quickly. And you're going to notice forward of the barrel cam lug, we've reinforced that barrel cam lug with more steel. And the BH Advanced Barrel, as of the time of making this video, has been in production and in use by high power owners for about six years. And we have never had an experience of a fractured barrel cam lug. The locking lug cam, these locking lug cams, that's that kind of crossbar that you see right there. When you see that little circle, that's the locking lug cam. You see it on both sides of high powers typically. Um, that is a fracture risk. Reason why there are aftermarket locking lug cams for high power pistols because it's a thing. Um, keep that slide velocity regulated. We can't say it enough. Fresh springs, um, excellent quality springs like BH optimized springs for high power pistols. These are insurance for the longevity and well-being of your handgun and the correct and proper function without breaking parts, which is a, I mean, it's unthinkable if you were in a defensive situation and you have a barrel cam lug break or a locking lug cam break. The the real the real hazard of both of these fractures, both the barrel cam lugs in high powers and in the locking lug cams, is we have seen situations where that fracturing caused uh, substantial enough damage that the frame was no longer serviceable and could not be repaired. Okay, we're going to move on to the next steps in the Inglis L9A1. Okay, guys, we are at step next, and what you have here is a really naked Inglis because we've stripped everything off of this so we could get a good look on the inside and get a good look at the metal uh, everywhere, and best way to do that is with the finish gone. So the finish is gone. You can notice here we've been... Uh, we're in the middle of some polishing work now as I uh, grabbed this stuff and made this video. And uh, we're polishing. We've media blasted the frame and the slide completely. Now we're polishing the uh, slide and the frame for a, a refinished project that we're going to be undertaking here very, very, very shortly. And among the things that we just we did notice when we, uh, when we uh, did the media blast now that we can look and see everything, um, one, we can see we didn't, didn't find any, uh, like big surprises. Um, there is one thing I'm kind of interested in, in particular, and that is this locking lug cam that you can kind of see pretty well in the, uh, video here. That is a mashed in component. It's literally mashed into the frame and then it's smoothed off, you know, on both sides after it's, uh, after it's mashed in. And the mash in part is how that locking lug cam, which is right there, I call it a crossbar, but at the locking lug, the barrel, the frames barrel locking lug cam is the proper name for that, uh, crossbar sitting there. So one of the things that we picked up on in the Gersans is we don't think that component is steel because it doesn't react to any kind of bluing or acid of, at, at all whatsoever. So I went ahead and I grabbed a bluing pen and I wanted to see, uh, are we going to be able to do any kind of bluings or color case hardened acid wash or anything like that with these? So here's the moment of truth. And we did not get any reactions like that um, with the whatever the Gersans locking lug cam is made out of. I don't know if it's titanium or what it is, but 
Um, it's not the same here in the Inglis. That Inglis uh, locking lug cam is definitely blacking. It's taking the bluing just like we would expect it to. So, okay, that answers one question there. We did also notice one other thing, and that is normally you don't have removable um, lanyard posts and lanyard rings, and this one here comes out fairly easily. Um, I'm not sure what their idea was there, but we're going to be looking for a more permanent uh, installation with this uh with this lanyard post when we go back together so uh, we'll address that that's no big deal uh at all whatsoever but uh we are just about ready to uh, proceed on to uh the finished process that we have uh, decided for this inglis l9a1 and that's what we're going to be heading to next we had one more observation we wanted to share about the inglis since the inglis is still naked here and that is regarding the beaver tail. Now, uh, unlike a lot of the Springfield uh, SA35s, we did not find a lot of obvious need for, we don't have an actual knife right here. Um, it, it does have some sharpness to it. It's not, uh, it's not been deburred like, uh, like some have, but um, I'm not gonna probably draw blood with that uh, on this one. And, and generally, the, the handgun seems pretty well deburred generally i want to show you though this little edge right here this is a little problem area on a lot of the high power clones and that edge right there did cut the hand of our right hand in our service department dave um this did uh, he did uh, a lot of the shooting with the uh, inglis l9a1 for us and he did get a little uh, laceration on and it would be like that point of the hand i've got one there on the uh, Springfield SA-35 once upon a day. And there we go. You can kind of see how this kind of points out to an edge right there. We're going to just knock that edge off. And this is an SA-35 that we recently deburred. And I'm going to show you, we just kind of nicely rounded this one even. This is more than deburring. This is... Um, this is rounding that edge, but it's going to make it a much more comfortable thing for the shooter. It's going to look very much better finished once we get a new uh, finish on that one. And all we're going to do is we're just going to hit this edge right there lightly with uh, some sandpaper. And just to get that, see if we can, there you go. We can kind of see how the edges and the edge here, the edge coming from this way, these still have kind of an edge to them and they kind of come to a, a point so to say out here on the beaver tail so we'll we'll get a little bit more refinement there so that can be a little more civilized in the hand and uh, no big deal though